Okay, this is a lecture for my seventh hour class on the 30th of March. Okay, when the Republicans were elected in 1900, William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt, when they were elected in 1900, uh, they promised, the Republican Party promised the American people that they would build an Isthmian Canal, that they would connect both oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic, because now the United States, listen, now the United States had a great empire and we had to be able to rush our Navy from one sea to the next. And so Roosevelt is now president and he wants to uh, live up to that campaign. He wants to deliver on that campaign promise, okay? Uh, and you can see here the logical place to build the Panama Canal was right through the country of Panama, this little narrow a nation right here that connects North America and South America. Panama is an isthmus. The whole country is one little narrow strip of land. It's 26 miles long, uh, wide, excuse me, at its narrowest point. And so, I mean, again, it's further from here to McAllister than it is across the nation of Panama at its narrowest point, okay? So that's where the canal is going to go in. Uh, the problem for Roosevelt, you know, he wants to get this canal underway. The pro you know, we've talked about gunboat and uh, uh, dollar diplomacy. We have, not we? Have we yes. talked about that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, the, 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 the problem for Roosevelt is, look, you know, he can't just go off willy-nilly and just build a canal through Panama. In fact, the, get this down, the country of Colombia owns Panama. You know, we've talked about the British Empire, the American Empire. We've talked about all sorts of empires. Uh, but Colombia had an empire too, and part of that empire was the little country of Panama. And so Roosevelt had to deal, get this down with Panama, and he tried, you know, the Panama Canal episode is a perfect example of both dollar diplomacy and gunboat diplomacy. He tried to deal with them uh, by pain. He said to the Colombians through, rep he sent representatives down to Colombia, he said to them, I'll pay you $10 million dollars for a 10 mile wide strip of territory, 26 miles long. And, and the Colombians said no. Uh, their attitude was every time we deal with those gringos up north, we end up on the short end of the deal. They get more and we get less. We do not want to uh, have any sort of dealings with the United States. And so Roosevelt's representatives came back. They said we offered the Colombians the money. The Colombians said no. So, Mr. President, we probably can't build a canal. And Roosevelt said, well, but I want that canal. And they said, well, Mr. President, there's only one way to do it if, you, if they want to take money for it, and that is to go in and take the canal. And if you do that, you will be breaking international law. And at that point, Roosevelt slammed his fist on the desk and said, damn the law, I want that canal. So here's what he did. You know, Roosevelt, did one of the things you need to understand about him is he was not someone to be deterred. You could tell him no. He could knock on one door and they could say no, and he would just keep knocking on doors until he found one in which someone said yes. So here's what he did. Get this down. <clears throat> he, um, he um, <clears throat> sent a group of agents down to Panama, just a group of Americans, all of a sudden to send on Panama. Now, they're dressed in business suits. They look like businessmen. And when the Colombians, you know, the Colombians are really suspicious about this when all these Americans show up down there and they start questioning them, you know, who are you and what are you doing? And they say, we're just businessmen. We're just looking to expand our businesses, maybe get some trade going here. And the Colombians were still suspicious, but they said, oh, we're going to watch them. In private, when these Americans, these Amer these are not businessmen. They're agents sitting down there by Teddy Roosevelt. And in private, when they were talking in private to the Panamanians, what did they, what did these quote businessmen tell the Panamanians? If you will what? I left out an important part of the story. 50 times, look at little Panama up there, 50 times Panama had tried to break away. Rose up and revolted against Colombia. 50 times, that's an important part of the story, 50 times the Colombians crushed them. But what do these agents tell the Panamanians now? If you join us, us. Huh? if you join us, if you like, help us take over. If you rebel, we'll help you. If you could try, one, make it number 51, we've been authorized by the President of the United States to tell you if you try one more time, you will have the support of the United States. 
And so in November, get this down, November of 1904, what did the Panamanians do? Panamanians rose, they rose up. And you just won't believe this, but just as soon as they declared their independence, <clears throat> right offshore, boy, what a coincidence. Coincidence. Right offshore, there was a U.S. battleship, the USS Nashville. Just pure luck, huh? And what did the Nashville do? They landed the Marines. And they said, we're not participating in this. We're just here to protect Americans. And this time when the Colombian army came storming up the road, instead of meeting a group of uh, Panamanian militia, uh, <laughs> they met the United States Marines. And guess what? Panama became independent. Isn't that a coincidence? That ship just happened to be there. How'd that ship get there? How'd that battleship get there? Huh? Panama what? Panama. There is no Panama Canal. They're trying to buy the piece. Of, they're trying to get the piece of land to build them. What was that ship doing there? Do you reckon? Waiting. For, waiting. waiting for the chaos. Well, yeah, but why is the ship there? How did it? Did it drop off the agent? Because Teddy Roosevelt. Because Teddy Roosevelt sent it down there and said, as soon as the shooting starts, what? John land the Marines. Okay. That ship just isn't sailing by. Oh, no. Roosevelt sent it down there. Okay? And by the way, there were only two casualties in this whole revolution. Only two casualties, two dead things. There was a Chinese laundryman uh, there in the town square. Once, you know, the Marines have landed and Panama's now an independent country, the people start celebrating. They shoot their guns up there. I don't care how many times you see it at the Western where they're all doing that. About 400 years ago, an English philosopher slash scientist named uh, Sir Isaac Newton taught us that if something goes up, there's a thing out there floating around called what? Gravity, and it's going to come back down. So don't ever shoot a gun up in the air. Uh, if you're around people shooting guns in the air, run and, you know, find some sort of cover. But this Chinese laundry man was there. He had a little donkey, and he had a cart with the laundry in it. He was delivering laundry. And uh, they're all out there shooting their guns up in the air. And a bullet came down and killed him and his donkey. And that's it. Those were the only two things that died in the Panamanian Revolution. If I was a citizen, if I was a citizen of Panama, I would, you know, uh, recommend that in the town square of Panama City, they put. They may have one for all I know, a statue of this Chinese laundryman and this poor donkey. But anyway, that's it. And guess what? Who was the first? Get this down. Who was the first nation to recognize Panama? So yeah, Panama is a legitimate. Independent country. Who was the first country? The United States. States. Gee, what a coincidence. The United States. And then, of course, what did we do? We said to Panama, or we said to the Panamanians, uh, we'll pay you 40 million. How much did we offer to the Colombians? 10 million. And we said to Panama, we'll pay you 40 million bucks just to sell us a 26 mile long, 10 mile wide strip of territory to build a canal. And the Panamanians were so grateful to the United States. What did they say? Sold America. So Teddy Roosevelt got, and in 1904, get this down, he started, the, or not him, well, I don't know, here's a cartoon, you know, the American people just love Teddy Roosevelt, and there's a cartoon, you know, uh, our cowboy, yeah, our cowboy president wanted that canal, they wouldn't give it to him, so what Teddy did, he just walked down there and started digging, and here are all the ships of the world waiting to get through, and look at that, Teddy is throwing Mud and guess where it's landing? It's landing oh, over here over in Bogota. What's Bogota? It's the capital city of Colombia. Well, this is another nid to Colombia, okay? And Roosevelt later said, he said, while the Congress debated, I took that canal. He would say that in private. He never said it in public. I took the canal. Typical Mr. Show Off Teddy Roosevelt, okay? They started building it in 1904, got this down, and it doesn't open until 1914. Okay, it took them 10 years. First ship went through in 1914. That was long, you know, Roosevelt left the presidency in 1909. But guess what? He, this was his favorite project. I'm telling you, he's so proud of the Panama Canal. And again, we don't even talk about the that Panama Canal today, but it was as important as the moonshot. It's important, it was in, in its day. Uh, and Roosevelt would go down there, and there he is, a little fat guy sitting in a white suit up on a crane, and he would make sure that his pet project was coming along uh, nicely, okay? Uh, and he actually lived to see the first ships go through 
the, Pan the Panama uh, the Panama Canal. Um, the United States, by the way, I don't know if you've seen the Panama Canal. There it is. Okay, that's not ocean water. That's rainwater. We get about we get about 35. If we have a good rain year here in Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma, we get about 35, 40 inches a year. Down in Panama, they get 1,500 inches a year. And they collect it in vats, and they feed it through dams to this canal, okay? And by the way, this is how the canal works. There's a series of locks. Uh, there are a bunch of people watching. See those doors are open. They filled up this lock, and then they're going to go here, and then they're going to go there, and then they're going to go across this lake. Just like this. That you sail in, it fills you up to the next level. And by the way, those ships... Now, this building here is about 30, 35 feet tall. The Panama Canal, those locks, they raise those ships 85 feet in the air, okay? And then you get to this lake, and you can sail across that lake, and then you get here, they pump the water out, they pump the water out, they pump it, and you go off into the Pacific. Or if you're going the other way, you go into the Atlantic. It takes about 8 to 10 hours for a ship to get through, okay? You, you can't uh, get your sea dew and just speed through there. It takes... Eight to ten hours, yes. With it? So you said they wanted that so it's like easy for military use, right? I'm sorry? You said they wanted the canal so they could have yes, the ships sir. go through. With Wait a minute. Canals. Don't say anything. You're about to make a good catch. That's what we call in history when you figure this out ahead. A good catch. So go ahead. This is music to my ears. So when, when they go through with their military ships, wouldn't the enemy just be sitting there and then when they come out one at a time, they just blow the ship to smithereens? You reckon? Eight to ten hours, yeah. Well, that worked, by the way. That worked in 1914. I mean, now we have planes using it. But now, huh? No. You know, it, it, look, get this down. We gave in 1978. So we, so we get the canal in 1904. In 1978, the president of the United States was a man named Jimmy Carter. President Carter, sadly, is dying now. Uh, he's Atlanta, he's in Georgia. I don't know if he, I think he's at home in Plains, Georgia, a little country town, smaller than Paula. He's dying. He's 98 years old. But one of the things he did in 1978, you know, didn't we say that Teddy Roosevelt really messed up the hemispheric relations, made us look like bullies? Yeah. Well, Carter tried to cure that. And he said in 1978 to us, and I remember this well, I was in college, and there's all kind of political stuff going on in college. But anyway, he said to the American people, we need to give that canal back to them in, in the year 2000. Well, I want to tell you something. In 1978, the year, talk about the year 2000. You're just going to talk about 400 years from now. But this kicked off the biggest debate. You made a really good point. This kicked off the biggest debate in American history that I have seen in my lifetime. Every night on television, there was a panel. There were two panels on the screen. One group of guys, experts, sitting over here saying we got to keep the canal. The other saying we got to give it back. And of course, the argument of those people who said we can't give the Panama Canal back to the uh, to the Panamanians was, hey, we're in the middle of the Cold War. What if we give it back? We're not down there to protect the Panama Canal. And who was our big enemy in the Cold War? Soviet Union. Yeah, and the Soviet Union gets control of that then they will have a foothold in our hemisphere and we'll lose the Cold War. Oh, my God, we can't give it back. But what's the problem with that? You know, and, and by the way, eventually, you know, when a pre President Carter went down and signed a treaty saying we're going to give this back in 2000, but when a president signs a treaty, what does he have to do? Does that treaty automatically take effect? No. What does he have to do? Go to Congress. Uh, which house? There are only two. Pick one. If you're wrong, I assure you, nothing bad will happen to you. What? The Senate. The Senate. That's exactly right. By the way, what does the vote have to be in the Senate? Two thirds. Sixty-seven votes. Do two thirds of the Senate ever agree on anything? Hardly ever. That's why you don't see many treaties. I was saying this the other day, and I can't remember the last time the president sent a treaty. You know what? If a president listen, if a president sends a treaty to the Senate and it fails. For all intents and purposes, his presidency's over. So they're very, very careful about doing that. They don't. Well, Jimmy Carter sent this treaty. There's this huge debate. People are marching in the streets. Don't give up the canal. Jimmy Carter sends this to the Senate, and the treaty passed by one vote. And you know, Jimmy Carter was a Democrat. And do you know who cast the one vote? A, a, a Republican. Hmm. You know who that Republican was? 
William from Oklahoma. People call him the founder of the Oklahoma Republican Party. They wouldn't let him in the Republican. He's one of my great heroes. Uh, I think he's the greatest governor and the greatest senator we ever had. He was the first Republican ever elected a governor in Oklahoma. You've all had Oklahoma history, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, then you know this guy. Right? No. You didn't learn this in Oklahoma history? No. no. How was Oklahoma history? Uh, just a bunch of computer. 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 We did a slide. You did what? We uh, went over slides like on Edmund. Oh. Ed? Edmund. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. That was great. What was his last name? What was his last name? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to wait for you to tell me. You've been in Oklahoma history since I have. I was in Oklahoma history in 1968. William. That's a long time. William smoked something, right? William what? He said William smoked something? No. Something like this. Something like this, no? Henry Bellman. I wouldn't worry about none of that. Henry Bellman, great American. By the way, he gave up his sentence in Oklahoma. Listen, 90 percent of the people of Oklahoma said we got to keep that canal, and uh, Henry Bellman put his political career on the line and uh, voted his conscience. He's a great hero. By the way, that shouldn't surprise you, guys. And by the way, some of these newspaper men uh, really condemned him. They said, "Oh, he was gutless and all this and that." You know, afraid to stand up to the president. You know who Henry Bellman was? Henry Bellman was a was a Marine in World War II. There's a little battle called Iwo Jima, and the first wave of Marines that went into Iwo Jima, 60% of them were killed. That's the first wave. You know who was in that first wave on that beach that day? Henry Bellman. And for these little punt newspaper men to call somebody like that a coward because he voted his conscience, it just, uh, I know this is being taped, but I'm sorry, it makes me want to choke. But anyway, uh, so now you got it on tape. You want to go to school board and say, oh my God, he's talking about choking people. You know, we're that. <laughs> I expect that to happen sometime. Anyway, so Henry Bellman saved this Democrat president, okay? Henry Bellman. Proud graduate of OSU, and by the way, when he got put out of the Senate by the people of Oklahoma, the way he didn't get put out, he, just, he, he could read the political tea leaves. He said, I'm not running again. But he became a political science professor up at OSU, and a lot of good people were privileged to sit in his class and learn about how this government works. They couldn't have had a better choice. But anyway, in 2000, we gave it back. And you know what? After all this fuss and bother, in 2000, it didn't even make the first front page of the newspapers. But you're right. You know, look, here's what Henry Bellman said. Do you think ships were bigger in 1978 than they were in 1904? Oh, yes, they were. They were much bigger. Do you think ships are bigger? Do you think our ships are bigger today than they were in uh, 1904 or 1970? Yes. Sure, they are. Most of our ships today can't even get through the Panama Canal. And like you point out, what if it would you really in a war with missiles flying everywhere? Would you want the fleet to slowly go eight hours to go through? They'd be sitting ducks. By the way, so what? What if the what if the Russians what if the Russians got to control of the Panama Canal? What would it take to dismantle the Panama Canal? One pilot, one plane, one bomb. That's it. And the Panama. So Henry Bellman and Jimmy Carter were absolutely right. Now, by the way, we gave it back in two thousand. Are American ships still going through the Panama Canal? Yeah. Yeah. Sure they are. Sure they are. You know. Uh, so anyway, uh, since two thousand. And by the way, we're saving money. Our ships can go through the canal. We don't have to keep the stupid thing up. We don't have to keep troops down there to protect it. That's a pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good deal for us. Okay. So speaking of deals, get this down. We're gonna we're gonna leave foreign affairs. We've been talking about foreign affairs. We're going to start talking now about domestic. Teddy Roosevelt's a domestic policy. Get this down. Domestic policy. Quickly here. Domestic policy. Now, presidents deal with two types of problems. We've been talking about foreign affairs, but now we're going to talk about domestic affairs. And domestic affairs, get this down, those are problems that the president deals with in this country, okay? Have we talked about this? Yeah. Now, well, now we are. So anyway, can you name me any, what, what are some domestic problems that Joe Biden is dealing with today? Drugs. What? Drugs, big one. 
I think, I think, I think seven people every hour die of uh, fentanyl. fentanyl. Yeah, that's a problem. Here, our economy. the economy. Can you give me a specific example of the economy? So that ticks you off? Do you drive? Yes. Yeah, you yes. like you like the gas prices? No. Do your parents like the food prices? Loaf of bread, a gallon of milk? No. I live by myself. I used to go to Walmart and you know get a little bit with you. When you push it past me, I can just almost carry it and live off of it for a week for thirty dollars. Now I never go to Walmart without spending a hundred bucks. We don't like that. Inflation is high, and Joe Biden is trying to deal with that. There's a crisis at the border. Okay, all those things are domestic policies. All right, well, Penny Roosevelt, get this down. The name of his domestic program, you know, his program to fix these problems in America, he called it. <clears throat> The uh, square deal, okay? Write this down. And I want you to know what he meant by the square deal. And by the way, later on, his cousin, his cousin Franklin Roosevelt will have a, uh, his cousin Franklin Roosevelt will have a uh, program called the New Deal during the Great Depression. Uh, the, uh, later on, uh, after Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman will have a domestic program called the uh, Fair Deal, okay? So don't confuse, don't confuse them all. Uh, or at all, I mean, uh, get this down. Um, so here's what Roosevelt meant by the square deal. Real simple, get this down. If you work, get this down. If you work, you should work. You should, you should earn, I should say. If you work, you should earn a living wage. A living wage. No American, Teddy Roosevelt said, get this down, no American should work and not have enough to eat. No American should work and not have enough to wear. No American should be homeless if they work. That's the square deal. And he said, by the way, these multi-millionaires, the John D. Rockefellers, you know, Roosevelt was rich. He said, these John D. Rockefellers, he said, I don't have anything against making money. I'm a capitalist. Roosevelt said, I'm a capitalist. I don't have a problem with making money. I don't have a problem with private ownership. Competition and profit, I'm all for that. But the wealthy have to pay in taxes, get this down, their fair share. Okay? Their fair share. So that's what the square deal Essentially, that's what the square deal is. And who, get this down, who is going to ensure this fairness? Look, here's what I'm asking you. If you're a worker in Andrew Carnegie's steel mill, you're down there with one of those rakes raking that hot molten, molten steel all day, and you're not you're working hard and you're not making enough money to support yourself and your family, and you go directly to Andrew Carnegie and say, "By God, I want to raise." Can you do that? No. no. But even if you did, what's he going to say? No. Huh? He's going to say more than no. He's going to say, "Get out of here. You're fired." So who has to be, I want you to write it down just like this, according to Roosevelt, who is a progressive liberal, who's going to be the referee between the people and the big corporations? The government. The government. Get that down. Roosevelt believed that government had a role to play in the lives of people. Who is going to be the referee? Who's going to ensure that everyone gets a square deal? In other words, and this is the way you'll see it on your test, probably, Topic today. I'm going to try and remember this. Here's the way you'll see it. Roosevelt said, my notes would look like this government must be an agency of, let me get this right. Government must be an agency of human welfare. One more time. Government, Roosevelt said, had a role. To play in the lives of people. There are some things that only government can do. And government has to do that. You understand what I'm talking about? That's what Roosevelt meant by the square deal. I want you to write this down too. He was supported by a group of writers, okay? Authors. Has everybody got this on the board? Everyone have that? He was supported by a group of writers, a group of authors. Some wrote books, some were newspaper people. Some wrote in magazines. Uh, they were, get this down, progressive 
writers, liberal writers. And, get this down, they were investigative journalists. What's an investigative journalist? What's investigative mean? Speak up. To search. What? To search. Search what? It's writers who investigate. You know, they say they've got little cameras now that you can just put right in the lapel of your coat, and you can go in some corrupt doctor's office. You know, you hear this report that this doctor is uh, writing all these prescriptions for Oxycontin to a guy, to a friend of his, who goes out and sells it. And then the doctor gets a kickback. He gets part of the money. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to besmirch the medical profession here, but uh, that that is actually happening. And how you know, and, and and a reporter will hear of something like that going on. He'll put his little camera on it. He'll go in and say, "I just want to interview you," or he'll just go into someone there in the doctor's office. He might get a job as a receptionist, or she might get a job, and she records all that. And you can see what's going on. And she exposes that, right? That's an investigative reporter, right? You understand what I'm talking about? Well, these people are investigative reporters. You get this down. They want to point us, they want to point out the problems. Are you with me? They want to point out the problems of society. So do they agree with right? And by the way, who do they want to fix those problems? So do, they, so, so do they agree with Roosevelt or disagree with Roosevelt? Yeah. They're all from, but listen, Roosevelt was frustrated with these guys because get this down. They wanted it done now. They wanted it done now. They wanted it done by sundown. They were constantly badgering Roosevelt. Why don't you get this done? And of course, Roosevelt's attitude is, look, I can't just clap my hands and do away with poor people or poverty. We could say that, not do away with poor people, do away with poverty. I can't just do that. It's a process. Yes, we're going to help the poor. Yes, we're going to create jobs. But it's going to take a while. I can't just do it all at once. And these writers will just keep uncovering more and more problems. They're just stacking up on Roosevelt. Roosevelt said, I've tried, and I've tried. Roosevelt said to them, you never write about anything good. There are a lot of good things going on in this country, but you never write about by accomplishments. You're always saying, here's the problem. Roosevelt ain't fixed it. And so he had a name for them. He called them the muckrakers. Write this down. The muckrakers. And he said, you know what? He said, if you dig deep enough, you'll always find what? Something wrong. You'll always find something wrong. Give me a chance before you dig it. Give me a chance to cure these problems, and then we'll go. The muckrakers just kept hiding. You see that? Roosevelt was a critical. Roosevelt called them the, muck, the muckrakers, okay? Well, here are some muckrakers. Write this down. I want you to know these people. Uh, there were a lot of muckrakers, but I'm just going to put the ones I think are the most... Uh, the most significant by Quakers. Everybody gotta play a break real quick. Quick break. Chuck Chuck. All right, have a seat. Well, here they are. I'm just gonna put them up there on the board. Uh, the first one is a man named Lincoln Stephens. Okay, Lincoln Stephens. And he wrote a book, and uh, these are all books that these guys write. Some of them were, some muckrakers wrote in magazines and some in newspapers. These are books. Uh, and uh, his uh, book was called, one of his books was called The Shame of the Cities. He's pointing out problems in the big cities. The shame of the cities. What, and boy, this is a broad opening question. What did he say the shame of the cities was? What was shameful about American cities, according to Lincoln Stephens? And that could be a lot of things, but what did he start it? Homelessness? Huh? Homelessness? Well, that certainly would be one, but that's not what he's talking about. But that's certainly one. He hadn't said anything wrong. What'd you say? I was about to say poverty. But... Well, same thing. Factories? No. Get this down. The big bosses, the political bosses. Okay. Look. 
He said in the big cities, democracy's dead. The people don't have any say. It doesn't make any difference who you vote for because who's going to make the final decision as to who wins the elections? The boss. So he said that's a problem. He said the big bosses are destroying what in America? Democracy. The what? Democracy. 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 Okay. Next, write this woman down. Okay, put a big star by her name because she may be uh, the most famous uh, muckraker of them all. It was a woman named Ida Tarbell. She wrote a book called The History of Standard Oil. What do you think that was about? Uh, what about him? Well, I think you just about said it. What'd you say? It's monopoly. Monopolies. Get this down. They said she said monopolies are destroying America. It's destroying competition. It's destroying the ability of the poor to rise to the top. You with me? And by the way, she had some personal experience with this because her father owned a small oil company. And Rockefeller's company tried to not Rockefeller personally, but his company tried to buy him out. And the man said no. You know, I, I built this company with my own hands. These employees here, these 20 or 30 or 50 employees are dependent on me. I'm not going to sell out. And what did the, the Rockefeller, this huge, gigantic oil monopoly called Standard Oil of Ohio, what did it do? It bought up all the railroads around him. And he couldn't ship his oil out and sell it. And he went broke. That was her own father. And so she writes the history of Standard Oil, condemning the, uh, condemning the, uh, Great, the great, uh, the uh, great uh, monopolies, and then this man, write him down, Ray Standard Baker. By the way, you know, you go to school. Uh, I'm sure all these books are on sale or are for sale. They may be on sales near the end of the semester, for sale over at OU. Most of them, because you're required to read these things in your history classes. Okay, uh, not just OU, uh, all all of these other universities as well. Ray Standard Baker, he wrote a book called Following the Color Line, okay? Following the Color Line. What do you reckon that was about? Uh, racism. racism. Specifically what about racism? It's the color line. What? Segregation. Segregation. Write that down. He pointed that out. He said the government needs to do something about this. And then this man, Jacob Reese. He was from Norway. He was an immigrant. And he wrote a book called How the Other Half Lives. Who was he talking about there? Really? Immigrants. Poor immigrants. And by the way, Jacob Reese, write this down. He didn't just write about it. Uh, he used the latest technology to report. And by the way, most, many Americans didn't know uh, the conditions that immigrants lived in. Tonight there would be a report on it on television and everybody could see it. But not in those days. They didn't know. Uh, and, and he exposes them to the conditions of the immigrants and the poor, but the immigrants especially, the way they had to live. Uh, and he took a camera. Get this down. He had a camera. He took pictures. You know, you heard the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, he put that into practice. He took pictures, and they were published. And you couldn't, you, didn't, you, you not only could read how these people live, but you could actually see pictures of them. Jacob Reese. Uh, and then uh, Upton Sinclair, uh, Upton Sinclair, put a big star by his name. <clears throat> he wrote a book, and I'm going to talk more about this book later. It was called The Jungle. What do you think that was about? The, war. Um, the what? The wars. No? You're thinking, though. Amazon. What? The Amazon. No. Nope. No, this, these all deal with American problems going on here in America that they say the government has to fix. Well, that would be a little bit of a stretch. Get this down, the meatpacking industry or the food industry, okay? The food industry. He showed how unsanitary. Get this down, it showed how unsanitary and how filthy it was. You know, when you go buy a pound of hamburger, do you follow market or Nichols grocery store or anywhere? You don't think on the way home, gee, I wonder if I put that out on the grill and make hamburgers if I'm going to be dead three days later. But that was a real concern in those days. And I want to talk more about this book, but those slaughterhouses were absolutely filthy. And who ran the slaughterhouses? The owner of the slaughterhouse. What's, Reed, what, what's uh, Upton Sinclair saying? 
Huh? No, I'm not getting rid of them. But clean we gotta them. clean them up. And who's gonna make sure they're cleaned up? Are the owners gonna do that? No, no, the government. By the way, you go down to McDonald's and occasionally you go down and you see these guys in hard hats and white coats. They're government inspectors, making sure that behind the grill down there, they're in the grease that bit with cockroaches stuck in it. Okay? Making sure it's clean, it's sanitary. You know, they're not poisoning the public. Uh, well, that wasn't true when he wrote that book, but as a result of this book, uh, the food supply of America is fairly safe. Well, I'd say worse than, or more than, not worse than, more than fairly safe. And then finally, this man, Stephen Crane, okay? Stephen Crane. You know, Stephen Crane, it's, this is not the book I want to talk about right now, but Stephen Crane wrote a book you used to have to read to get out of school. It's called The Red Badge of Courage. You want to build your brain? You know, I'll tell you something. If you don't read, you're not educated. I don't care how many times... How many diplomas or certificates they give to you? High school diplomas, college degrees. I don't care if you haven't read, you're not educated. You should have to read to get out of school. This book is in our library. You ought to go pick it up. You know, and about 30 years ago, some idiot said, or maybe not, it doesn't make any difference what kids read. We just want kids reading. What an idiot. If you don't think there's any difference between uh, a tale of two cities and Sports Illustrated, uh, you need to go sit down and talk to someone. It makes all the difference in the world what you read. That's a great book. That'll build, and it's a great story. It's not, you know, it's not like you're going to be, there's going to be a, you know, somebody standing behind you with a stick beating you while you're reading, so you'll suffer. It's a great story. It's about, and I'm not giving anything away, but it's about a young man that goes to fight the Civil War, and he thinks he's going to be a great soldier. And when the first shots are fired, he runs away, but he later regains his courage. And I haven't given away anything, but it's a great, inspiring book. Just one second. But that's not the book. You ought to go check that out of the library. It'll build your brain. But that's not the book I'm talking about here. Stephen Crane wrote a book called Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. A Girl of the Streets. And underline that. It's about a girl. She and her mother immigrated from Ireland. The father had abandoned the, the, the family. She's uh, 12 or 13 years old. When they get to the United States, the mother dies. The little girl's left in the streets of New York by herself. She finds a kind gentleman comes up. And he says, I'll give you a place to stay and something to eat. Who was that kind gentleman turn out to be? A pimp. And what does he do? He prostitutes her. And this little girl to live, 12 or 13 years old, has to sell her body to people on the street. And it ends with the pimp beating her to death at the end, beats her to death. Unless you think child prostitution, child trafficking, all these things, I don't know if you know that's just happening now in the 20th century. No, it's been around for 10,000 years. I told in an earlier class, if I could clap my hands and take us all back to ancient Babylon 10,000 years ago, the streets would be full of child prostitutes. It's as old almost as the human race. Come to the office, please. He wrote about that and said the government has to take action to end this deplorable situation. All right, your test is tomorrow.